Mike Green served over 15 years in special forces, including three years as an assaulter in a Sinks in Extremis force, focused on direct action counter-terrorism missions. He also served as an instructor for the Special Forces Advanced Urban Combat Course, where he taught advanced marksmanship and close quarters combat training courses. Michael has been teaching tactical firearms since 1992 and holds a master classification in IDPA and USPSA. He has instructor ratings from multiple organizations, including the NRA, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, the United States Army, Surefire, Six Hour Academy, and Tom Givens Range Master Instructor, Advanced Instructor, Master Instructor, and Shotgun Instructor programs. After leaving the military, Mike spent several years on numerous overseas as government contracts. Mike is also a member of the Pro Staff for Sons of Liberty Gun Works and a Modern Samurai Project endorsed Red Dot Pistol instructor. He has consulted for numerous training facilities, developed, planned, and implemented training along with providing instructor development. He has been a lead instructor, consultant, or director of training at over 10 different training facilities. He has trained civilians, special operations, military and law enforcement units in the U.S. and throughout the world. Mike, how are you, man? I'm doing great. Great to, um, great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Oh, absolutely, man. It's it's always a pleasure talking to you. you. You're a wealth of knowledge and you're a gentleman. And I don't say that to everybody because lots of people are not. And uh, you've got a certain, I don't know, Elon, you know, I'd have to say it's a big fancy, you know, European word there. But uh, uh, I've always liked just talking to you, man. So um, how was work today, man? Staying busy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, always staying busy, um, always working, you know, several different things at the same time, uh, you know, and then, of course, uh, throwing a little bit of family life in there, too. You know, Yeah, man, that could be crazy. But well, that's yeah. why I wanted you on, man. I wanted to talk to you about hard targeting your life and how I see you as a friend, but also as an outside observer. You know, I see that you've got your job, you've got your family um, and you're very organized. You're very disciplined to do the things that you do to shoot the way you do and to teach people, you really have to be disciplined. You have to really um, do that every single day to keep your life in order. You have to have some type of structure and it seems like you're doing it. So tell me about green ops. I mean, how did you get, well, let's, let's, let's rewind. Actually, let's go further back into history. Tell me about um, you in high school and how did you go into the army and the green berets? Um, you know, I, uh... Growing up as a kid, I think I watched the movie The Green Berets. Uh, I was really fascinated with that, uh, you know, with John Wayne. Mm -hmm. uh, in high school, I'd read the 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 book. Uh, Rod, uh, Moore had written a book, Inside the Green Berets, I believe it was. Yeah, Robin Moore. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, uh, read that and just kind of uh, became infatuated with it. And, uh, you know, I knew I was going to go in the military, but that just, you know, kept, you know, calling me. And. So that's exactly what I did is, uh, you know, I went in after high school, I, I joined the reserves and uh, went straight in to uh, training and then um, came back for a summer, finished up some work. And then next thing I know, I was in the Q course at a young age of 19. How did that work for you? Was that a challenge? I mean, some people really struggle. Um, how'd you do? How'd you place? Um, well, it was, you know, physically it was, you know, I mean, at that age, you know, yeah. it's, you know, being a a athletic in high school and stuff like that, it really, I mean, it was challenging, don't get me wrong, but it was really, um, it was the immaturity that was the, the biggest issue that I saw, you know, uh, being the youngest guy there at the time, you know, prior to 9-11, you didn't see a lot of young guys in special forces. Most guys were in their thirties or late twenties. And, uh, you know, I'm some snot nosed kid that came around and, uh, you know, these older guys took a liking to me and fortunately didn't kill me and they mentored me, you know. <laughs> That's um, really cool, man. Yeah, yeah. So, so what's your best, uh, you know, what's your favorite memory from your time there going through the Q course and then graduating? I really just, you know, the guys that that helped me through the Q course, you know, that 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 would really, you know, like I would complain about things and they're like, look, you have no idea. You haven't been in a conventional unit. You haven't had to do these shitty details or crappy details and stuff like that. And, you know, um, they pulled me aside, you know, and yanked me up by my collar, <laughs> put me in my place. And, uh, you know, initially it was, you know, that, uh, you know, the ego of, you know, how dare you talk to me, but you know, they outranked me, they were older yeah. than me. They had more experience than me. Um, you know, a lot of them had Ranger tabs and, um, you know, I came around and said, but you know, these guys got something to offer. I better start listening. You know, So that's but, so important yeah. is uh, listening and, and brotherhood, really. I mean, you have it a team, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. a key in, for success. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. 
So, you know, did you have any failures, um, you know, going in there, anything you regretted that um, you changed? I mean, you know. Um, I wouldn't say anything I regretted. Um, you know, I wanted to be a combo guy. So I, I, I had issues with the uh, Morse code portion. Um, I'd always wish that I had, you know, became a combo guy, I became an engineer demo guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, no, no regrets. I mean, uh, yeah. I don't really think I would have changed much of anything. Um, you know, um, I, I had the luxury of having people, you know, older than me and wiser than me that would tell me, Hey, do this or don't do this or don't do that. And for some strange reason, even though I was young, I tended to listen to those guys. Yeah. So I, I really, I, you know, I got a lot of things done when I was in the military that a lot of people would say, Hey, that's luck or lucky. Mm-hmm. But the truth is I just listened to my mentors and did what they told me to do. You know, um, instead of waiting for things to happen, I looked for them, you know, um, you know, they said, Hey, if you want this, go talk to the battalion sergeant major. Hey, if you want this, you know, call a uh, human resources at, at, you know, army human resources command and ask them for this. And they can always say no, but you know, these are your options and, and utilize them, you know, of course, not everything, you know, came to fruition, you know, there were, there were no's along the way, but, um, you know, um, uh, I, man, I, I really had a great time in the military, especially in special forces. The, my last three years as an assaulter in the SIF or sink or excuse me, SIF or CRIF that they call them today, uh, was amazing. You know, the guys there were just phenomenal. So how did it work when you you graduated? I mean, you got on the time on the team, your ODA, um, you know, fish out of water, just getting there. I'm sure they all welcomed you in. They probably put you straight. Um, tell me about the tra- trajectory of your your time on the team from graduation to the time you separated. So I graduated the Q course. I went home because I was in the National Guard, and then I uh, turned around, went to a recruiter, and um, you know, went back on active or straight into third group. Uh-huh. Um, and then from there, I spent a couple of years on, uh, in a second battalion, third group on an ODA there. Uh, we were so new this, the battalion hadn't even stood up. So the, the team rooms were practically empty, you know? Um, and we built, built them up. Um, and after a couple of years there, um, because I didn't go to language school right after the Q course, like a lot of my peers did because they were active duty, but I was in the guard. So I went, um, I finagled. By calling Human Resources Command, I finagled a slot to DLI out in Monterey, California. I went wow. to California for Spanish. I came back, was assigned to Seventh Group, um, and just I spent another th- four years there on a on a team. Um, then after um, you know moved around and I did my uh, SWIC tour. So as an instructor, you know I taught at the uh, Anti Terrorism Training Detachment at Fort Bragg. It was more or less a uh, you know, pre-deployment course that we had worked out in conjunction with mainly the state department to meet mm-hmm. their standards for people going to embassies. So, you know, it was open to, um, dependents of military personnel that were maybe going to an embassy or going overseas. So, you know, we basically told them or, you know, taught them how to be hard targets, uh, not just for the terrorists, but for criminal yeah. activity too. Um, and that was a five day course. So they got a lot of information in that time. Uh, really just amazing stuff outside of your normal, you know, camouflage uniforms and painting faces and, you know, running around and shooting guns. It was, you know, civilian clothes uh, up on a platform, um, interacting with, um, you know, sometimes general officers and colonels that would come that were going through these courses and dealing with civilians that would come through. So it was a, it was a big change, you know? Um, and, um, you know, it, you just you couldn't be a knuckle dragger and 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 just you know be out there. You had to have your 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 P's and Q's straight. You know, definitely. So uh, amazing yeah. course. Uh, they don't teach it anymore. Um, but I really got into a lot of the force protection stuff. Uh, you know, traveling overseas stuff and awareness and how to keep people safe in regards to that. So that was that was amazing. Yeah, we see so much of that so important, especially in Benghazi, right? With the State Department guys who got in there and I actually, one of the guys was on my team. And so, um, I I'd asked him, I said, you know, where are you going? And he had left our company and, um, ended up uh, going to Benghazi. Um, and he said, Hey man, we don't have enough training. We don't have enough equipment, et cetera. So a guy like you able to get these guys up to speed. That's a great thing, man. If you, you get a guy like you. Um, so what would you say is probably the trait or the strength that 
someone should have, uh, you know, going into your line of work? Um, you mean like special forces or, um, yeah, special forces. And also just, uh, you know, your, your, your career pre what you're doing right now, you know, going to special forces and SIF and sync. Um, you know, I, I mean, you see it now today's soldiers, you know, or, or, you know, regardless of what service people go into, um, they're far smarter than, than they were when I came in, you know, okay. uh, we've got, you know, the internet, YouTube, um, every bit of information that someone wants to, to, to research, they can find mm -hmm. it. And so, um, these folks are, are coming in. Uh, I run into them. I was last July, I was working down at Bragg with some okay. special forces guys and just amazed at the talent there. Um, you know, young, younger, younger than the average when I was in, uh, physically more fit, um, skill wise, just incredible. Um, and the mentality was totally different, you know, uh, always mm -hmm. mission focused. And so I think that today, you know, one, um, the kids today going or looking at trying to go in the military, uh, I think that fitness is really the key, you know, mm -hmm. um, obviously they're going to, they're going to test you. You have to have a certain, you know, IQ or ASVAB to get into special forces. Um, but I think just, you know, being open and listening to those folks is really key, but, but fitness is obviously the, a big, big discriminator there. Uh -huh. But, uh, the other thing that we're seeing now, I think with the, uh, the younger generation, cause you've got, you've got kids that have been doing CrossFit since they were 10, you know, right. you know, 10 years later, they joined the military. They're going to crush any type of selection, but the, the key is a the mentality there. So, um, can they stand, being wet can they stand being cold can they endure you know the harshness mm -hmm. uh, the physicality of something like that for for an endured uh length of period and i think that's really you know it, anyone can be fit you know to especially today with so many great programs out there that they have today um you know you've got all kinds of performance athletic um training programs out there mm -hmm. with high intensity so um, you know, anyone that does that for a year or so is ready, I think, to go to some type of selection, but they really got to have it up here. This is the key, you know, they got to have that grit, you know, um, and um, that's just a matter of, you know, sucking it up, you know, mm -hmm. um, we, we've, we've become as a society in general, just a little bit too comfortable uh, with things, but you know, seeing, but that doesn't mean that the young generation today is not capable of doing it because I've been overseas with these guys and I'm telling you, you know, they're fierce warriors, even though they're, they're, they're younger, you know, um, they do have it up here, but just not everybody does. And, and I think that's a learned thing. I don't think mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you know, some people say, well, they're either born tough or they're not, but no, I think it's uh, something people can learn. So you can be a self-starter, but if you're around, a really good group of people you can really excel it sounds like oh definitely definitely you know because those people being around people that are better than you faster than you stronger mm -hmm. than you are going to lift you up make you try harder and it's it's a cycle you know um on, on the the last team i was on i recall you know there were guys that were good at certain things and the rest of us would try to catch them and eventually maybe get better than them. And then they would try to get better than something that, you know, I was at or whatever. And just yeah. the whole team just, just got better and better. And got better. better and better. Was yeah. there anyone that stuck out in your mind, like an instructor or a student of yours, anyone that came under your, you know, um, command or someone that uh, you looked up to and, and learned a lot from, even though maybe they were the same rank? Uh, well, I would say the, uh, my, my first and last team sergeant, you know, mm -hmm. were, um, were guys that really impacted me. Uh, that um, both of them had uh, really, regardless of what your your rank was and what your MOS or job was, they would put you into areas where you could excel, and they would explain to you. My first my first team sergeant was great uh, mm -hmm. as far as mentoring a young person and saying, "Hey, you need to do this and this and that. Um, these are the things that you should excel." uh on on a team or on oda you know you need to strive for fitness you need to be on time right place right uniform all this um and you need to be very competent in your skills you know that's second to none you know your specific job you need to be the best at it and you know if that requires you as an engineer to go and take classes um you know off post um sign up for something at a um 
you know, a community college in engineering or, you know, um, carpentry, he goes, and that's what you need to do. And you need to take it upon yourself. Um, and then my last team sergeant was really about like, Hey, I don't care what your job is. What, what's your passion? What are you good at? That's what we're going to put you in charge of. And, uh, he would, he had this knack of taking guys. Um, for example, we had a medic on a team Mm -hmm. and he put him in charge of all the heavy weapons training because that was the guy's passion. And some of the other weapons guys would be like, Hey, how come Mark's in charge of the heavy weapons? And he's like, well, can you teach a class as good as Mark? Can you shoot that gun as good as Mark? And they were like, no, you know? (laughs) So he just, he had this knack and this ability to take people and put them in positions that they excelled at. They loved. And, um, now that was, so again, my first and last team chart. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Now you separated from the military. And how did that work for you? I mean, some people don't like it. They're they're unhappy in their civilian job and they want to stay in. But I mean, there, there are so many reasons that come up, you know, divorce or, um, you know, some issue. Uh, and, and so for you, um, you moved on. Uh, um, what was the deciding factor for that? And did you think you made the right choice? Yeah, you know, so I got out a little early. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, if I did have a regret in life, it was not finishing up those 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, my, I had always planned on going back in. But once you separate completely, like out of the guard and IIR and everything else, then it is, becomes very difficult to get back in, especially if you have service-connected disability or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had always planned on going back in. That was okay. that was my thing. I was like, I'm just going to get out. I'm going to go overseas. I'm going to go to Iraq. I'm going to go to Afghanistan, whatever. And then I'll, I'll come back in the Army uh, in a couple of years. And, of course, one thing led to another. And... Uh, Man, I, I will tell you what, to me, there was very little transition. So I felt like I went from working on an ODA mm-hmm. to working on an ODA, you know? So the guys I worked with were all special operations guys, different services, but again, all very like-minded individuals, very skilled. You know, we had a selection process that we had to go to to get where we were at. And it didn't matter if you were, you know, like we had a guy who was an E9, um, and uh, he was the best private out there, you know, We're like, hey, Lou, you know, do you want to be in charge? He's like, nope, because I'm a driver. And he had the vehicle out there 30 minutes before, you know, us leaving anywhere. And he had, you know, checked every inch of that vehicle. He had cleaned every window, every mirror, nice. you know, and it was amazing, you know. And I learned a lot from that, too, you know, a little yeah. humble pie, you know. Um, you know, if, if you're going, if you get tagged, I don't care what position you could be making a thousand dollars a day, but if the boss tells you, Hey, we've got some VIPs coming over and I want you to clean that kitchen and mop the floor, then guess what? I'll be the highest paid janitor in Iraq at that time. And I'll, I'll, I'll gladly do it, you know, yeah, um, because there's a mission, you know, um, everyone mm-hmm. thinks everything's all about, you know, kill, maim, destroy, attack. But in reality, you know, in the outside world, when you're working, you know, with other, other organizations, you know, you have these meetings that are important and, you know, you don't always have people around to, to do that. So you have to sometimes be that guy, you know? So what's your morning routine like, or what's your daily routine like? I mean, you you know, we see a lot of guys that get out and they get really overweight or in poor health and you've maintained it. I mean, I remember the first time I saw you, I'm like, this dude is Jack, man. He lifts weights. And, <laughs> you know, we're about the same age. I'm like, where's my muscles? You know, I'm looking at you. So <laughs> You've maintained that. So where's that come from? That discipline? Where, where does that come from? Well, um, at, it, it really, it came from my time in between work overseas. So when I would mm-hmm. come back to the States, um, I found myself gaining weight, um, going to places I probably shouldn't have gone, um, you know, maybe drinking or indulging too much in something. Yeah. And it just, I just woke up one day and said, what, you know, why, why am I having a difficult time here? And I broke out the, um, the training schedule that we had when I was on an ODA. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to recreate that schedule, but for myself. And so instead of staying out till two, three in the morning, I started going to bed at a decent hour, getting up at a decent hour and then making a regular schedule of saying, I'm going to work out every day. I, I'm going to go to the range every day. I'm going to do jujitsu every day. Mm-hmm. And of course I utterly failed, you know, because I tried to do too much, you know? Yeah. And so after a while there, there, you got to have balance. You just have to have balance. So instead of doing something every day, it became maybe twice a week or every other day. Um, and you know, I can't, you know, work out every single day, 
So maybe three days a week, you know, Uh um, I can't get up. Like for example, right now, my biggest thing is, do I want to be better at shooting or do Uh I want to better be better, you know, or more fit. And so uh, I've alternated and said, okay, uh, on certain days, I'm going to get up early and I'm going to dry fire on certain days. I'm going to get up and I'm going to work out. Um, after work, I'll, I'll have the same dilemma, you know, do I, do I go do jujitsu? Do I work out? And so instead of wondering what I'm going to do, I try to schedule it, you know, and that's what I have. Literally, I have a schedule and I try to stick to it. Now, obviously we don't always stick to it, uh, but I try to come to as close to it as I can. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the best thing about, you know, that is, you know, my wife is very like-minded in regards mm-hmm. to doing certain things. And so I'm blessed to have her, you know, remind me, Hey, you said you were going to do this today. And I noticed you didn't, do you want to try to make time or rearrange our schedules to fit that in there? And so that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Your wife is for guys. So and girls, if you're listening, his wife's super fit, uh, shoots, uh, and competes very athletic. Uh, my wife uh, is on me all the time too, to remind me uh, because I do forget. And like prior to this podcast, you know, I was working out. And uh, so Mike is a very disciplined guy and it's great that he has a wife that does that too. Uh, so I think that's important, right? Mike is to have someone on the same page as you and obviously have a schedule and uh, have some type of structure. Yeah. So, yeah. That's cool, man. So, um, how did it work for your business? I mean, how did you start Green Ops? And uh, tell me about that. And also, um, where are you located at? Okay. So, um, you know, after I got out, you know, started working overseas, um, working with some of the companies I was working with and, and different organizations, uh, they wanted us to have uh, some type of a company or corporation that under our name so that they could they could pay through our company. Um, And so I took their advice and opened up Green Ops back in, Mm -hmm. I think it was 2005. And so that also facilitated not just working overseas, but when I was in the States and training folks, now I had a company that people could pay me. uh, Instead of paying me direct, they could pay my company. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I did that. I subcontracted out for pre-deployment training and stuff like that, mainly all government stuff. Um, And then um, I did that up until 20, probably 2010. Mm-hmm. And then um, I probably took about a, a couple of years off for uh, for doing any type of training uh, under Green Ops. And then in 2011, 2012, I started actually running open enrollment courses in Northern Virginia. And uh, that, our first open enrollment was up in Highview, West Virginia, and uh, up there, in, you know, because I lived in Northern Virginia, mm-hmm. near D.C. And then... Um, you know, just kind of went from there and then started teaching classes out at the NRA headquarters there mm-hmm. with a couple other guys. And it just kind of blew up and expanded. Um, now, you know, I moved out to Texas, but I still have a core cadre in Northern Virginia. And those are our, um, those are our primary classes. Like our Northern Virginia classes sell out almost every single one of them, particularly anything involving uh, carbine. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, now we're, we're getting our feet wet out here in Texas. Big difference people don't realize, and I didn't realize until I got here, is, you know, Texas is a gun culture. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you, li- you have a big enough plot of land, you know, there's nothing stopping you from going out on your back porch and shooting, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, here, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to get someone to go, well, why, w- why should I go to, why should I pay someone to go to the range when I can go in my backyard, you know. Or, yeah. you know, hey, I've, you know, I've been around guns since I was a kid, you know, and, and it's true. You know, people have a lot of, you know, firearms experience. Now, it's not always the best experience because, you know, we don't know what we don't know. But um, it's harder, to, in my opinion, to get folks into training in uh, in Texas. Um, but there is a, a group of folks everywhere, you know, that are getting more involved in training, you know, uh, just not just Texas, but across the nation. But in Northern Virginia specifically, I think people are more uh, tuned with what they don't know. They realize that, hey, you know, they haven't been around guns all their lives and they need this training. Um, and, and folks who think that they know what they're doing when they come to a class, that's really the key. If you can get somebody into a class um, you know, even for free the first time they realized their eyes are open, like, wow, I didn't know, you know, that how much I didn't know or how unsafe I was. Um, but you know, we're trying, we've got 
you know, a location in Virginia, a location here in Texas, and then we do the traveling road show. We'll teach classes, you know, we taught classes in Georgia, mm-hmm. you know, out west, up north. Um, we'll, you know, uh, we'll we're capable of coming and running mobile training to anybody's location. Yeah, and so there are a lot of people out there. They're doing uh, firearms training, you know, the pistol and rifle, but you offer a buffet of talent and a buffet of classes. And so, you you know, you're, you're at a certain level. Um, so two questions for you. I mean, where do you think um, this country is going to be or industry is going to be in five years? How's this going to look uh, for the firearms and, uh, you know, firearms owners? Um, where, where do you think that's going to be? And do you have a pet peeve about the industry at all? Um, uh, I think that, you know, today, as far as training goes, mm-hmm. uh, as consumers, we have more variety, um, at our disposal than ever before, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's one of the things that makes, uh, green ops so popular is the fact that we have such a diverse and amazing crew of folks. You know, we have, uh, competitors at the national level, grandmaster, master class level shooters, um, and then, you know, we've got, you know, law enforcement, law enforcement instructors, uh, guys who are NRA instructors, guys who are former special ops, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, um, Ranger battalion guys, soft guys, uh, and then guys who've never been in the military before their lives, you know, um, and everybody works together, you know, and uh, they're able to take their skills that they've um gain throughout time and and, mm-hmm. and pass it on to the uh, student and i think that you know as far as an industry goes it's just it's going to become more competitive that's yeah. just you know there's no doubt and that's just because of the talent that we have out there in the world today i mean we it, you know as instructors i have all almost all of my instructors are con- going to continuing education you know they're training with guys like uh steve fisher uh modern samurai project mm-hmm. um you know scott jitlinski uh steve anderson um you know, you name it. We are sending guys to other courses, uh, Tom Givens, Range Master Instructor courses. Um, we we look at those guys not as competitors, uh, but more as partners. And the truth is, is that we'll see some guys who come to our classes to go to their classes and vice versa. Um, and uh, there's plenty of business out there, but I, I really do see it being more and more competitive. Uh, pet peeve, I guess, is kind of like the, uh, you know, uh, there's a there becomes a little snobbishness in some mm-hmm. arenas. Uh, you have some really high level individuals out there that may look down at some people who uh, aren't high level shooters, but you know they have maybe uh, the tactical background. Um, and then sometimes the tactical background guys look at the high level guys and, you know, say, well, they don't know what they're doing. They've never been in, you know, a defensive situation or a tactical situation. But, you know, if, like, for example, me, I, you know, I'm a master class USPSA shooter. I've shot three mm-hmm. gun. Um, and then, you know, former special forces guy. So, um, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of, of, of everything I would say in the shooting mm-hmm. arena. And I think there's so much to learn from each other. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I look at like, what is the goal of the student, you know? Um, and I tell guys like, uh, I had some of my instructors that were, you know, talking about another instructor who was rather, um, an older guy, but not very skilled. And they're like, ah, that guy's, you know, he's, you know, he's not teaching really up to date, great stuff. And, And I said, well, who are his students? You know, are they looking for advanced level training? Are they trying to get just, just to be basic and safe? I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, people are trying to just become basic, safe gun owners, you know? And I'm like, well, then he's the perfect guy for it, you know? Right. Um, You know, we, we just, you you have different degrees of, and, and, and that's a good segue. You know, I look at, you know, some folks will contact us and say they want to take training and they don't, they're not as familiar with firearms and we'll recommend them to, you know, a local NRA instructor that we know and say, Hey, maybe you want to take a one-on-one class or a, a class with this instructor before coming to us. Um, and people are like, well, why would you do that? I'm like, Well, you know, I mean, let's, let's think about the amount of money they're paying us versus the amount of money they need to pay that other instructor. It might be more cost effective for them to train with someone like that first, you know? Um, and, um, 
and those instructors tend to get better as instructors too, you know? So I think that especially in the gun world, as, as far as a pet peeve goes, it's that we don't work well enough together and everybody, you know, it just finds something wrong with, you know, this instructor or that instructor. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing that, I think they need to focus more on the second amendment and um, yeah. you know, focus on bet making themselves better and Hey, getting out there and voting, being part of uh you know, their PTA or whatever it may be, council member and something. But, um, yeah, stop, stop bragging. Yeah, we, I mean, we saw that with Joe Biden, right? He said, you know, um, gun control. What did he say? I think it was last night in the news. It's kind of like, come on, man. You know, you're pushing this narrative over and over and over uh, about defunding the police for, what, three, four years. And now all of a sudden you're going to say that this, this crime and all the shootings with cops, well, we got to take away guns. Okay, Joe. But, um I, I, it, to me, it's also what I call more or less alpha. And I'm not going to go trash someone because they are less than what I think. If they're on the same team, maybe I'll say something uh, aside, but not I'm publicly, I'm not going to try to shame or trash talk anyone. I just don't think that, I think it's counterproductive. Yeah. If, if someone is out there, look, I don't want to get some guy and you're teaching a class and then you're going to make him do bends and thrusts and carry weights and make him puke. And that's not what he wanted. That's not what he signed up for. He had no idea that you're going to, you know, make him do running and all this other stuff when he just simply came there for basic pistol. Yeah. And, yeah. and some of these guys want, I guess, to get their Instagram going and get their name out there, but that's just not the right way. And I think what yeah. you're doing is generally, but it's also, uh, being insightful. So, um, you know, what's the one thing your business venture does that you didn't expect i mean that it grew i mean did, were you surprised um when you started your business i mean did, was were there any people that surprised you on your team or how the business went did that surprise you in a good or bad way oh i, I think it, it well obviously it surprised me in a really good way um mm -hmm. you know when um i started bringing folks on and they just kind of you know went with it when matter of fact when i i looked at uh moving out here to texas you know i considered kind of just letting things go with green ops you know and the guys that were there said no you know we want to keep doing this and i'm like okay well you know that's uh that workload is going to fall on you guys and mm -hmm. they were like we're, we're ready for it and man were they ready they took it to the extreme you know um, they would ask me, you know, Hey, do you mind if we do this, this and that? And I go, look, I, you know what, as long as we're getting the, you know, the point across mm -hmm. and we're sticking to the pillars that I like to preach. Um, and you guys have been mentored by me as far as how I instruct. And then if you feel like you're doing the right thing, then keep going, keep doing it. And I am, and I, you know, I empowered them a little bit and they just empowered themselves after that. Um, and same thing with the Texas crew, you know, um, but the guys are, are phenomenal. And, you know, you see that if um, you don't micromanage people, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's going to be times when they need a little guidance, but nine times out of 10, most of the guys don't need any guidance at all. They're, they're, uh, they're ahead of the power curve. Um, and, you know, people tell me all the time, like, Hey, you know, you got, you got lucky with this crew. And I'm like, God, I don't, you know, I, I, after a while, I got to say, you know what, I've been able to do it. Uh, maybe it's just a selection process that I go through in my head and go, Hey, I like that guy. He'd be a good mm -hmm. fit, but these guys are just amazing, you know, um, top notch. And maybe it's cause, you know, I, you know, I, I saw quality when I was in special forces and just came accustomed to the way f people acted there then maybe somehow I see it in the folks that I work with now and say, Hey, that guy's going to be really good at this. And even though they're not soft back background guys or are, you know, it just, they get in charge or they start doing and running classes and they just, they, they take it to the next level. You know? I think you've done a great job. Maybe you're not giving yourself enough credit. I mean, I know you do that in your day job, which is observe people to watch people and to suss them out. And I mean, you pulled it together with Julian and Josh, oh, yeah. and Chris, you know, and Luke, and these guys are very personable and yeah. they're not obnoxious. They're not condescending and they are so likable and helpful. And I think you've done a good job putting that together with people, even your wife as well, you know, getting in there and it's not sh being a, a showboat. So I think maybe give yourself more credit, but I think you probably put it all together and then it's just been very natural. You know, it's progressed. Yeah, so, it has. Yeah. Yeah. People definitely need to check out green ops incorporated. Uh, so check out the website and we'll, we'll put the links down, but, um, you know, is there a myth about your job or field of expertise, something that you're always trying to dispel, you know? Yeah, you know, that's, um, you know, I've heard, uh, 
I've heard other folks say it, you know, when they say, Hey, you should train with Mike green or green ops. Mm-hmm. Um, people say, well, you know, he's a special forces guy. Well, I, I might be, but not all, not all my instructors are. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's that, you know, ah, oh, you know, what does a green beret know about can, you know, carrying concealed without backup and, you know, all this other yeah. stuff. And, uh, it's interesting because, uh, to me, that's, um, that's ignorance. You know, what, what does a green beret know about teaching? Well, first of all, in the Q course, that's one of the things that you have to learn to do in the Q course is teach because primary mission of special forces is FID or foreign internal defense, which is basically taking ODAs and sending them to other countries and then taking their military and then teaching them. So you're constantly teaching. So prior to nine 11, you know, I was in multiple countries teaching, you know, either using an interpreter or without an interpreter, trying to speak their language to folks who one, you know, didn't speak English and probably couldn't even read in their own language. Um, and I had to be able to relay information and have them do certain tasks. So if I could do that with foreign nationals, then when I came to the States to teach people, then it became, I think, rather easy to do. Um, but the other side to that is that, you know, people think that, you know, Green Berets are kicking indoors and, you know, killing everyone, letting them, you know, uh, let God sort them out type attitude. But, you know, um, you know, anyone that's been over to Iraq or Afghanistan worked in, you know, multiple situations, they know that the rules of engagement over there in many places and during many times changed to the point where they were more restrictive than any citizen could ever go through working in the States, you know? Yeah. Um, and of course, being out in the middle of nowhere without backup, you really had to make decisions that, hey, you know what? I could get away with shooting this guy because I can, but maybe I shouldn't. You know, mm-hmm. and it's the same thing. Use of force here. I, you know, I see it all the time. You know, um, you know, the great thing about having this technology today is that we can go and, you know, open up YouTube and see videos of people who got in shootings and go, yeah, that's totally justified. Well, it may have been justified legally, but morally, you know, it's questionable. And, uh, you know, overseas, we were exposed, I think, to a lot of that as far as like, hey, yeah, I could, I could do this. But you know what, there could be second, third order effects, you know, not just on me, but, you know, on our government, you know, mm-hmm. and, and so people, they need to realize that, you know, what, what is one, uh, what makes a good instructor? Well, I'll tell you what makes a good instructor, someone who's done it a lot and, and special forces guys typically have done a lot of teaching. And then, you know, especially if they get assigned to an instructor billet, like I did three years as an instructor at SWIC or mm-hmm. training group. Um, and then of course, um, you know, not just teaching, but interacting with people, you know, cross-cultural communication. Um, so, um, that's kind of a pet peeve of mine is, is seeing people, you know, you know, just be dismissive of, of military folks. And it's like, Hey, you know, n- not, not, um, especially special forces, you know, were designed to be instructors. That's one of the key things there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of a myth, you know, that, that like the bust mm-hmm. there, you know, I also think the myth is also, you know, all military are kind of like, uh, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood and heartbreak bridge, you know, just a mean <laughs> dude. You don't want to be around that guy, but with you, you come across as a very thoughtful person and, uh, you know, you're paying a class, right? 250 to 800 bucks, whatever that class is, you do not want to be told, you know, you're an idiot or a moron or just, um, an instructor that's impolite, but I've always noticed that we, where does that come from? Your personality? Is that from your, your mom and dad growing up? Or is that t- something you learned on the teams to be very patient with people and very um, personable? Where does that come from? I think that's a, uh, I would say, I think that's a special forces thing. I mean, when okay. you have, you know, when you have someone that you're training and they do something wrong, like, point a loaded gun at your face you know Mm -hmm. the first instinct is to you know get upset take the gun away from them and beat them down but when it's the ranking highest ranking commander in that unit in that foreign country (laughs) that's not the the time to do that you know um so you have to be as politically correct as possible and and realize that you know you know most warriors are are made um they're they're forged. They're just not born that way, you know? Um, and so, um, seeing and working with these different militaries, people from different backgrounds, um, you know, you had to bring them together and and create them, 
and make them into soldiers and, and make them into, you know, assaulters or whatever they were trying to be. And um, I, I, I definitely think with, you know, cultural differences that you had yeah. to be able to do yeah. that. And as an example, one time I was working and um, one of the guys we were training um, had drew the firearm and basically shot an inch away from his foot into the ground. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in Iraq. And so I go up and, you know, the interpreter, he saw that and I'm going forward and the interpreter was a prior military guy himself, you know? So he's like, uh, looking at me, waiting for me to say something. And I, you know, I tell him, Hey, you know, you just, you just, you just had an accidental or negligent discharge. Mm -hmm. And the guy looks at me and he says to the interpreter, basically, he said, no, he didn't. And I go, you tell him he's a liar. And he looks at me and he goes, Mr. Mike, you cannot do this. This will insult mm -hmm. him, you know? And I go, okay, well, then you ask him if he's calling me a liar. And he goes, ah, okay. he goes, this is very good. He goes, you understand our culture. And so he did that. And the guy apologized, Yeah, you know? And, you know, my goal wasn't to kick the guy off the line. It was to make yeah. him more aware of what he was doing, you know? But later on, I remember that interpreter telling me, he's like, man, he goes, that was great. He goes, I've had other guys from special operations work with us and, and they would have just yelled at that guy, you know, he goes, but you, yeah. you, 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 the special forces guys, he goes, I like you guys. Cause you guys are always thinking about, you know, not, not insulting the people you're working with. Yeah. And, and uh, so, you know, I, I'm just making the assumption that's probably where it came from is most of my time in special forces, you know? So do you have any tools that are indispensable to you, whether it's uh, material goods like a gun or a, a book, a journal that you keep? Or is it something else like, um, you know, being very knowledgeable or, uh, you know, having tact or diplomacy? I mean, what, what are your everyday tools that you need to bring or what you would recommend to our listeners and viewers um, that you need every day to survive? Um, well, that's a good question. You know, um, I mean, there's so much just constantly going on in my head and, and yeah. stuff like that. So. Um, you know, obviously I try to stay, you know, where, whenever you can, you know, be legally armed, you know? Okay. Um, and you know, it's, it doesn't always have to be with a firearm. You know, if you have to go to DC or something like that, you know, you know, carry maybe a blade or, or some type of an impact weapon or OC, but the biggest thing is the mind, you know, okay. you have to be aware. Um, you, you just, you constantly have to, you know, play these little games where you're looking around trying to spot the bad guy. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think the, the other thing is like when I come home every day, you know, one of the first things I do is I watch uh, active self-protection uh, John Korea because he has a video or two every day mm -hmm. and it shows some type of encounter. And I think that, and I'll call my wife and kids and we'll, we'll, you know, if I see a really good one and go, Hey, we need to watch this over again. Uh, but, you know, even my eight year old knows that when we are pulling in somewhere in a parking lot that I'll ask him, what is this? And he's like, this is a transitional space, you know, and that's something I learned in executive protection and PSD. Uh -huh. And, you know, John Korea points that out all the time. And it's, you know, to me, it's like, how do I be my own bodyguard? And yeah. so I want to try, you know, not only to, you know, have my wife be that way, but I want my kids to be that way, to oh, be aware. Sure. You know, um, and children are so naive. They're so innocent. Like, you know, they see a homeless guy and they're like, you know, hey, what do you see? And they're like, oh, we see that, that, that nice old man sitting there. I'm like, why is he there? You know, uh, there's no one else just hanging around, you know. Yeah. Um, that nice old man is probably a homeless man. OK, now it, it could be totally harmless, but, you know, we have to be aware that there's a person there. Um, and, you know, keep that pointed out that we need to be aware of what's in front of us, behind us and around us. Um, I think that's important. The other thing I like to do is whenever, whenever I get in the car, you know, I'm always listening to a book in the past. I would like to try to read as many books as possible, mm -hmm. but there's just so much, so much I'm trying to do in my life that I, I don't have time to read the book. So now, you know, audibles, uh, you know, different, um, different programs. I can't remember the, the other one I listen to all the time, but you know, I'll find books out there and, uh, overdrive. Yeah. So, uh, audibles and overdrive. Um, I'm listening to something all the time and I don't listen to fiction. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always listening to something self-help wise, something as an instructor where I can learn, you know, like, uh, yeah. talent, talent is overrated. Uh, you know, how the mind works, um, you know, how the brain works, uh, physics uh, of the body, 
um, you know, I want to be able to, to be able to reach out to people and, and, and make them learn faster. And, and how do I do that? Well, you know, I have, you know, experience doing it, but I, if, if I know how and why, and so I read up on these topics, I think it makes me better. Um, you know, um, Lanny Basham, uh, has a really good book out there that Steve, um, Steve Anderson recommends, uh, winning in mind. And then, um, you know, I try to listen to stuff like that. But that's that's my key thing. There is uh, trying to obtain as much information as possible, and then implement it. So, how about um, as far as those who serve the community? So, if you got Jocko or you know guys like him, um, is there anyone that you particularly uh, recommend or admire? Someone that you don't know, but just from all appearances, and I, I don't mean friends of yours like Scott Jedlinski or any of those guys. But is there anyone out there that you say, oh, that's interesting, and I could learn something from that individual? I am I've uh, been on a Jocko kick lately. I've listened okay. to um I think four or five of his books lately uh -huh. and then I'm re-listening <laughs> to two of them, you know? Like yeah. I, I know the the one book I read or listened to, I'm like as soon as I got done with that one, I said I'm going to listen to that one again. Yeah. And it's very interesting because he talks about like deconfliction and you know, you have two barrel chested freedom fighters that come up against each other, and how do you deconflict that? You know, there's a little humility there, and I really look at that. Um, you know, understanding what someone is saying, why they're saying what they're saying. You know, I, I would tell you this. You know, relationships are based on communication. I don't care who you are, whether it's your boss, your loved one, or whatever. It's always yeah. communication. And I see people every day, especially with A types, that look at each other and go, "What? Why did you say that?" You know, and the question is, well, why don't you ask them? Yeah. You know, and when you do, you come to find out that there was no harm intended, you know. Um, and so to me, that is really important, especially, you know, in relationships. I have found that the biggest problem with relationships is communication. And like for, you know, English is not my wife's first language. So we have discovered over the years that that is part of our communication uh, problem, you know? So, yeah. you know, uh, me, I have to realize that when I say something and she doesn't understand it, I have to be able to better communicate as opposed to getting upset. And then when sure. she says something, the same thing, you know? Um, oh yeah. But, um, it's uh, amazing too that you will find that just taking a step back and rethinking or relooking at a situation can really make a big difference. And uh, so again, uh, the Jocko books, anything he's been you know ri mm -hmm. writing. Um, I I don't listen. I started off uh, listening to a, a couple of his YouTube videos or something like that, and it kind of got me interested in it. And then after that, I'm like, I just don't have time to watch them on YouTube. And then I picked up a book and it was like, wow, this is great. Um, but yeah, yeah. Stuff like That's that. Um, you know, uh, you know, there's other stuff. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, uh, he's got some really good books out there about learning. Uh, his latest one, I think is blank was really fun. I thought that was really phenomenal. Um, but yeah, just, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, the older I get, the more I want to learn, you know? Great. That's fantastic. And I, th I think you've got the, the the temperament for it. So let's talk about communication. I mean, is there anything that people misunderstand about you or the most? Uh, anything that uh, you're not able, not able to convey in a way that you want to or because they're not receiving it properly because they lack? Uh, I mean, where's that um, disconnection happening? And how, how do you find that you resolve those issues? You know, that's a really great question, you know, because um, I find myself in situations, whether it be, you know, working on the range or at work mm -hmm. or overseas or something where I will say something and it just doesn't get the impact that it does. And um, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, you have some folks out there that when they speak, it's like the old EF Hutton commercial where everyone listens. Right. And, I, and I have to realize that I don't have that, you know. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm looking in at myself to go, okay, what do I have to do to better present, to get my information across and to get people to do what I want them to do? Um, because this information is valid. Um, and I, I just, I'm not there yet, you know, but, um, the other thing that works really good is that I know people that are really good at it and I'll say, Hey man, can you tell them this, <laughs> you know, yeah. but I, I don't always have that in my hip pocket. So, um, you know, I, I've told, uh, one of my other instructors, you know, he was telling me, he's like, ah, you know, I feel really, um, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I'm as good as an instructor as you, you know, when we work together and I'm like, dude, 
I have seen you on the line where I will say something and the instructor just in one ear or the student is in one ear and out the other. You come along and say the exact same thing in a different way and they listen to you. I go, it doesn't matter. We all have something to offer, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really, it's, it's, and I haven't figured out that magic yet, but it's really on how you convey, uh, information. And, um, you know, I don't, it's something I need to, you know, I'm trying to look into that. Uh, th- I know there's some good books out there. I just have to eventually get to them, but, um, you know, you know, of course, how to win friends and influence people is a good one. Yeah. Uh, I think I've listened to that one like three times, but, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's not a hundred percent perfect. I'm not happy enough with it. Um, yeah. but, um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, I think that right there is, uh, you know, everyone doesn't listen to what I have to say, you know? <laughs> sure. Um, well, you know, Stephen Pinker, right. So, um, he's written a lot of books. Um, and, uh, he was talking about, I think we're a Russian fisherman and a Finnish fisherman, you know, and at their meeting 200 years ago, and one guy speaks language X and the other guy speaks the language Y they don't speak each other's language, but they can find some type of commonality. They can speak the, the least or the most basic, right? Um, common denominator, right? Where can they fit in? And that's what it is. It's just patience and listening, right? And um, really trying to understand and having empathy. And I think uh, uh, it's it pays off. I know in relationships too, uh, my wife and I, we do misunderstand each other. We have to work <laughs> for it. But let me ask you something. Um, what's the best compliment you've ever re- uh, ha- had? Um, I had... Um... I had some students at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. We were running an open enrollment course. And, um, you know, I was um, running a basic course, pistol carving, so that people would meet a prerequisite to go to, you know, training like Kyle DeFore, Larry Vickers, or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kyle Lamb type of a course because they have certain prerequisites. So I ran this course, and there were two guys in the course who – they didn't need to be there. They were just there because they were training junkies, you know, and they were both, I think, in the 82nd Airborne there. Um, this was, a, you know, a, an open enrollment class. And the guy who helped, you know, put everything together, he told me, he goes, yeah, these guys, you know, they, they know that, that this is, a you know, a basic course, but they, they love to train so much that they wanted to get into this class. So he's like, I let them, you know, in at half price. And at the end, these guys come up to me and they're like, hey, man, that's amazing. That was a great course. They're like, uh, are you a Delta force OTC instructor? And I'm like, what? I go, no, I'm, I'm a special forces guy. You know, like what makes you say that? And they're like, well, we've trained with some of the best instructors out there. And those guys have got to be the best instructors we've ever trained with. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm sure they are, but, um, and I appreciate the compliment. And I go, yeah. but are they the, the best instructors or do they have the best students? And they looked at me and they're like, what do you mean? And I go, well, I mean, if somebody doesn't shoot that bullseye, you know, hundred percent and then, you know, or they miss something and they're told to make it better the next day and they don't, then they could be dropped from the course. You know, as a special forces guy, when you're working in a foreign country and you train somebody and um, they don't quite make the standard, you don't have the luxury of saying, Hey, they can't be in this training anymore because it's the host nation training. And so the other thing that we fail to realize is that as much as people complain about the way the hierarchy here is in, is in the United States, you know, I've had a guy who was the cousin of the secretary of general of, uh, of their military in a class who was basically mildly retarded. And there was nothing we could do to kick that guy out of that class. There's yeah. no way that guy was getting kicked out of the class. So we had to take this guy and train him in the best way that we could in a foreign language, you know? Um, and we did, I thought we did an excellent job. We made the guy safe. So he wasn't going to hurt other guys. You know, mm-hmm. that was a key thing there. Uh, but overall, you know, we were able to take this guy and bring him up to a level that we really honestly didn't think we could get him to. And, um, you know, we, we don't always have that luxury. So we have to use different forms of communication to get through to these guys. We can't just say, Hey, you need intestinal fortitude to make mm-hmm. this happen. We have to work with them uh, because they're not always the best student. And so I've, I look at that as, you know, special forces guys um, had a lot and, you know, we had a lot of, of hurdles that we had to jump over and get, mm-hmm. go through to get these guys to where they needed to be. And the only way you could do it is just, uh, you know, find the different ways to educate these folks. You know, you learn about, you know, the different methods that people learn, whether it's hands on visual auditory and you incorporate all of them, you know. Uh, at one point, you know, I was telling someone what to do, physically moving them, 
and you know, doing all this so that they were feeling me touching them, moving them. I would demonstrate so they could see it and then speak it to them. So, you know, we would do as much as we could to make these guys learn. And um, I think that's a, that was the a best compliment I think I'd ever heard to be compared to somebody like that. Cause those guys are phenomenal over there. Oh you know? yeah. yeah. Well, I forgot. You just reminded me of something, how much involvement you've had with those guys. So uh, do you want to speak about that at all with Scott Wolf or with uh, Larry or any of that or green man group, or uh, is that something you, know, you can chat about or, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. you've, you've have so much experience. I just realized, my goodness, you you were there when it uh, kicked yeah. off. Yeah, so you know, uh, it was a great group training, you know, back in the day. But the other thing was is that you know a lot of folks, you know, um, they don't realize that those guys were at Fort Bragg. You know, mm-hmm. so it wouldn't be uncommon for you to run across a guy that you knew from over there, you know, in the commissary or you know out in town or something like that. And so, friends of friends introduced me to uh, Kyle Lamb. Uh And, uh, next thing I know, Kyle Lamb took me to my very first USPSA match, you know, and he helped me, you know, not only show up, but, you know, Hey, do this, don't do that, you know, and, and mentored me through a stage, you know, and basically through the whole match. And I was just so impressed with that. Like, Hey, this guy is, you know, one of the top tier one dudes out there and he's taking the time to work with me. Like, this is Uh incredible, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, just a, an extremely humble guy, you know, and, uh, you know, next thing I know I'm shooting in, you know, a pretty consistent manner out there in Fayetteville back in the day. And I would run across these guys. You'd see guys, you know, that are very popular today. Um, uh, you know, um, Pat McNamara, Larry Vickers and, mm-hmm. and guys like that. You, you would see them at these USPSA matches, you know? Um, and you're just, wow, man, these guys are, they're, they're, they're normal guys, you know, just, I mean, very, very physically fit and talented individuals, but they're normal guys and they have the patience and they would, you know, talk to, talk to us and, you know, help us out. And then when I went to, uh, work at the SIF, you know, we did, uh, we did a lot of stuff with those guys, you know, uh, got to work with them, did some, uh, some great stuff. Uh, they came down to us. We'd go over there. We'd send guys over there. Uh, we had quite a few guys in our unit that came from over there. So mm-hmm. that was, that was really the good connection right there. Uh, our company, Sergeant Major, you know, worked over there for years and did his last couple of years in the army over at our unit. And, um, uh, amazing that, uh, the structure that they brought, you know, Hey, we're going to do this. And this is why. And it was like, Oh, wow, that's great. You know? Um, but, um, again, you know, it, it's, it's, it's humbling to be around guys like that and have them help mentor, you know, me as a young individual, uh, even as an older individual. Uh-huh. Um, and you just, you look at these guys today and go, wow, man, these guys have done really well for themselves that have gotten out, you know? Um, and, uh, I really can't say enough good stuff about them. Really great guys. Yeah, I think um, it's so important to be just a humble instructor, right? You're taking on a guy, a student, whatever age he is, and he can end up being a very stellar student. And he oh, can, yeah. um, you know, uh, you, you see that. And there are some yeah. great guys out there. They take these young guys out there who are hungry to learn. Um, so let's talk about hard target in your life and, and you, um, what does that look like? I mean, you know, we've talked about communication, we've talked about teams, we've talked about patience, um, and always being a, a student that learns, um, you know, being earnest, uh, for you, what's your daily structure like? Um, what's really important in your life uh, to get your, 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 your life moving in the direction that, that you want. Some people don't know, they have no clue what they should do next. They have no purpose, mm-hmm. no meaning, no function. Um, but you seem like you're pretty driven and very focused. Well, first is, you know, trying to work in, um, what I, I want, I want to, you know, I want to spread a message. I want to train as many folks as I can, Mm -hmm. um, you know, big proponent of the second amendment, but not only the second amendment, but any type of security or safety training that folks can use to keep themselves safe or their organization safe. Um, and, and to make people better. Um, Mm -hmm. that is, that is extremely important to me. Um, I want everything to be as efficient as possible. Um, okay. How do I get better without putting in a ton of work? You know, and that's the other thing is, you know, I've learned that I can be, you know, instead of spending three hours in the gym, I can do 15 minutes of high intensity <laughs> and get an extremely great workout. Um, instead of going to the range for four hours and shooting a thousand rounds, I can dry fire for 30 minutes 
and you know maybe not get the same results immediately mm -hmm. but over time you know, if i am consistent with my dry fire then it's going to pay off on the range in in, a, in an hour session as opposed to four hours um but family you know i want to try to spend as i want to try to minimize as much of my time training so that i can maximize my family time you know mm -hmm. um and and to me that's that's the most important thing right now, you know, um, as you know, I have at my age, I have young kids. And so I want them to, uh, I want them to learn as much as possible, um, about the world and things that they can do to be better people. Um, you know, not, not just, you know, Hey, really good at jujitsu or really good at fighting or, you know, shooting or anything like that, but, you know, to be really good people to do the right mm -hmm. thing. Um, I think that's incredibly important, you know, um, you know, we've, we've really gotten to the point where, um, you know, folks are afraid to do the right thing and, and uh, it's understandable, you know, um, because you see people doing the right thing and they're arrested and sent to jail. They go to trial for a year, you know, um, it happens all the time, but the yeah. truth is that we need to do the right thing and we need to train our kids to do the right thing. So, um, and not just our kids, but, you know, others out there that are willing to listen, you know, um, I think that's that's important um, to me. Um, the you know, like I said, family is the most important thing. But you know, second to that is helping helping make uh, you know this country better every day that we can. Um, you know, I, I think that most people who are complaining and uh, you know talking about you know going to battle inside this country, I think are are really. Um, don't realize that if we're fighting an enemy from within, they're just going to outlaw us, you know, there's, there's not going to be any battle, you know? And so I think is what we need to do as individuals is one, we need to become educated and not only educate ourselves, but educate others. How do we do that? You know, obviously attempt to um, get to the media, you know, become, become a media spokesperson, become a reporter, become right you know, um, educate, you know, at my age, you know, I'm probably too young to start a new career as a journalist, <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe someday I could be teaching at a university or something like that. Um, and then of course, after your five years or whenever you become tenured, you can come out of the closet and go, I'm a conservative, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, a very liberal conservative though. Uh, but, um, yeah, I think that those are the things that are important to me. It's really yeah. good, man. So, um, Favorite movie, man. Something that has really made an impact on you. And some people say Gladiator, and that's cool if it is. And maybe it's a Charlie Chaplin movie, whatever. But uh, what movie really changed your life, man? If there was anything out there. Oof. Uh, you know, that's a tough or movies, one. Or, or anything that comes yeah. to mind. You know, it's funny because my dad was a huge James Bond fan. Okay. And so uh, I remember as a kid watching these James Bond movies over and over again. Um, and then, um, you know, later my dad had them all on uh, VHS. Yeah. And I could watch them all back to back. But, you know, VHS, uh, you know, the, the, the Green Berets, of course, really good one. I think that yeah. had a huge impact on me. But um, as far as like a movie that just kind of like, I don't know if it's uh one that just kind of always sticks in my mind when people ask me about a good movie is No Way Out with Kevin Costner. It's not oh, a movie. Yeah, that, I remember that, that movie. Yeah. It, it's not a movie that impacted me. It's not a movie yeah. that changed my life or anything like that. But that's one of those movies where uh, I, and maybe it did change my life in regards to what I pay attention to because mm -hmm. all the signs were there throughout the entire movie and you had yeah. no idea. No and clue until like, the end, man. Yeah. And then when you watch it over again, you're like, oh, it's right there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a really stellar movie, but as far as movies that maybe had an impact on what I, you know, like what I wanted to be when I grew up, you know, I would have to say watching action movies like the James Bond movies and the Green Berets. Um, I think that really had a, an impact, um, as far as me wanting to go into, you know, being a special forces guy and, and doing contract work overseas. I think that probably was probably it. Cool, man. So what, um, there was one question that I asked you, you know, and well, I didn't ask. I mean, what, what should I have asked you? Did I leave anything out, man? You know, and how would you have answered that? Uh, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, like, uh, um, I would say what makes green ops successful? Um, yeah. and I will tell you, it's not my green. 
<laughs> it's okay. not. Um, it's literally uh, two things. It's one, the backbone of Green Ops is my wife. She's uh, she's incredible. Uh, Hard she, worker. She, yeah, she manages everything. Like no one would understand the behind the scenes that she is is constantly doing. And the other thing is the guys. The guys that do all the work, man. The, my instructors are incredible. Um, you know, I never, I never, you know, people say, Hey, those guys work for you. And I'm like, well, they don't really work for me. You know, they, they, I work with them, you know, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Um, I just, I'm the founder and, uh, you know, they're, they're just, I mean, they're incredible. I, 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 if I could spend my waking day with those guys, I, I would, you know, um, mm -hmm. I never get tired of talking to them. I never get tired of going to the range with them. If we get a, a chance to go to dinner or something like that, um, they're, they're people that I always want to be around. They make me feel better about myself um, because I want to be more like them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they're just, I mean, incredibly talented people um, that are always, they're always trying to get better. And, 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 and me, I'm always, I, I'm, I feel like I'm the same way, you know, that's why I'm constantly, you know, reading books, you know, I'm constantly dry firing, you know, I'm doing these things where I'm, you know, in my fifties going, oh, I'm too sore to be doing this or too old to be doing this. And here I am still doing it, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And, 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 you know, I, uh, I look at other guys that are older than me that are just incredibly fit, you know, and you see them out there and you're like, wow, man, you know, I, I got a couple years, you know? <laughs> so, well, guys, um, we're going to end the show in just a minute here, but listen, check out green ops, um, INC they're on Instagram, green ops, INC one word. And I think it's michael.green.18 F, you know, 18 Foxtrot. Um, Good people, man. You know, I've been with people and I'm driving in a car with them. I wonder if they're going to jump out and start beating the hell out of someone. And you always wonder, you know, maybe they're a good instructor, but they're not good people. Uh, Mike and his crew are good people. Very pleasurable, you know, very pleasant. Um, all around awesome guys. Great to be with. Um, shirts. I forgot about that. Apparel. If you want to get uh, shirts from Green Ops, please go to Spotter Up Shopify and you can get their apparel. Awesome hoodies, awesome t-shirts, great looking designs. Mike. You put together something really good, and I've learned a lot, and I think a lot of other people learned a lot, you know, about communication and, uh, you know, drive, willpower, and all that other stuff. So I wanted to thank you for coming on, man. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, man. I appreciate everything that you do for Green Ops, too, man. Yeah, man. Awesome. Well, we'll talk soon, but don't go anywhere. I'm going to sign off right here, and we'll, we'll do some chit-chat right after the show, man. But, uh, guys, thanks for watching and listening. Take care.